Biceps pathology. The biceps muscle has two tendons in the shoulder, the long head and the short head. Pain at the front of the shoulder commonly occurs from conditions affecting the long head of the biceps tendon. The biceps tendon of the long head arises from the superior labrum at the top of the glenoid. It passes underneath the transverse humeral ligament in a groove between the lesser and the greater tuberosity of the humerus. As you can see here in transverse view ultrasound, you can see the biceps tendon in the groove and the subscapularis tendon medially and the supraspinatus tendon laterally. And you can see the transverse humeral ligament covering the biceps tendon. The biceps tendon inserts into the proximal radius at the radial tuberosity at the elbow. Here you can see the insertion of the biceps tendon at the radial tuberosity. And the biceps tendon is inserted into the ulnar part of the tuberosity. The long head takes advantage and inserts proximally. The short head is inserted distally, as you can see here in this diagram. The short head of the biceps arises from the crocoid process. Innervation of the biceps. The biceps muscle is innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. Musculocutaneous. Musculo. So that's the biceps. Cutaneous means supply sensation to the lateral aspect of the forearm. The muscular cutaneous comes from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. So what is the function of the biceps? It is a humeral head depressor. It is a flexor of the elbow. But the brachialis also is a flexor of the elbow. If you lose the biceps, the brachialis works, but you lose some flexion with losing the biceps. The biceps is really a strong supinator of the forearm. If you lose the biceps, you lose about 40 to 50% of supination of the forearm. What are the conditions affecting the biceps? Biceps tendinitis, biceps tendon rupture, biceps tendon subluxation or dislocation, and slab lesions. So let's talk about biceps tendinitis. The biceps tendinitis is an inflammation or irritation of the upper biceps tendon. It occurs due to microtrauma to the tendon and overuse and repetitive overhead activities lead to biceps tendonitis. These activities will include sports such as baseball, tennis, swimming, or lifting weights. Biceps tendonitis usually occurs in association with other shoulder problems such as shoulder impingement, that's very important. The rotator cuff tears, shoulder instability, tears of the glenoid labrum, and shoulder joint arthritis. Shoulder impingement is the main cause of biceps tendinitis. Shoulder impingement is often referred to as rotator cuff tendinitis or shoulder bursitis and the impingement is an irritation of the rotator cuff and could lead to breakdown and tear of the tendon. It could be considered an overuse syndrome. How do you examine the patient for subacromial impingement? You do the impingement provocative test.
Warn the patient before doing the test. So when testing the shoulder for possible impingement, make sure to warn the patient before beginning the examination because this may cause pain in the shoulder. The whole idea of the impingement test is that the humeral head will squeeze the rotator cuff tendon and possibly cause pain. Near impingement sign, the examiner will passively elevate the pronated arm of the patient above the level of the shoulder. A pain response due to the impingement is considered to be a positive sign. How about near impingement test? The impingement test is different from the impingement sign. Impingement test means you inject the subacromial space by local anesthesia or local anesthesia and destroys, and you can get some immediate relief of the shoulder pain. That will be a positive impingement test. When the pain symptoms are relieved and the patient feels better due to the injection. How about Hawkins test for shoulder impingement? Hawkins test is different than Hawkins sign. Hawkins sign is a sign that the talus is alive. And you can see that sign six weeks after a Taylor neck fracture, if the talus has vascularity. So how do you do the Hawkins test? Flex the shoulder and the elbow to 90 degree. Intend to rotate the shoulder, and this will bring the greater tuberosity of the humerus underneath the acromion, which could cause impingement and pain. Pain caused by this maneuver is considered to be a positive Hawkins test. In biceps tendinitis, the soft tissue between the humeral head and the acromion is pinched or is squeezed with arm movement. What are the symptoms of biceps tendinitis? Anterior shoulder pain. If you localize the pain anteriorly to the region of the biceps tendon, then the patient have biceps tendinitis. And that is best done by eliciting bicipital groove tenderness and use the speed test to help in the diagnosis. So the speed test is done by asking the patient to actively forward flex the shoulder while the forearm is spinated, while the examiner is applying resistance to the movement. Tenderness over the bicipital groove indicates biceps tendinitis. What is the treatment of biceps tendinitis? Conservative treatment, such as rest, modification of activity, ice, physiotherapy, or a steroid injection around the tendon, not through the tendon. Surgery is done if conservative treatment fails, and surgery can be biceps tenotomy. The damaged biceps tendon is released from its attachment. Then we cut the biceps tendon and let it fly. It is done in the elderly and in low-demand patients. Bicep tenotomy is also done in the elderly patient with shoulder pain and massive rotator cuff tear. It's done when the patient has reasonable active forward elevation and the cuff is irreparable and the shoulder joint has minimal arthritis. Biceps tenotomy is an effective treatment for this patient when the pain is the main symptom. And the patient may have subjective cramping and this biceps stenotomy may result in a papai bulge of the arm. Another surgical treatment for biceps tendinitis is biceps tenodesis. The damaged section of the biceps is removed. The remaining tendon is reattached to the humerus. It's usually done for active, young, high-demand patients.
Another condition affecting the biceps is biceps tendon rupture. The rupture can be proximal or distal. The biceps tendon may rupture at the top of the bicepital groove, or it may rupture at the radial tuberosity in the elbow. So the proximal biceps tendon rupture occurs at the bicepital groove, and the muscle moves towards the elbow to create a Popeye muscle. With proximal biceps tendon rupture, there will be minimal loss of function because although the long head of the biceps ruptures, the short head of the biceps will remain attached to the coracoid process. A diagnosis is often obvious for complete ruptures because of the deformity of the arm muscle. You will find a big ball of muscle in the arm as you can see here in this picture. The papaya muscle is not from eating a lot of spinach. It is due to a biceps tendon tear. What is the treatment of the biceps tendon tear? The rupture may be treated either conservatively or rarely surgically. Non-operative treatment is usually done for the elderly. Most patients will become asymptomatic after four to six weeks. In fact, the majority of patients will experience relief of their shoulder pain after the biceps ruptures. As regards the surgical treatment, reattaching the torn section of the tendon to the bone, tenodesis, usually done in association with other reconstructive surgery, and it is rarely done for cosmesis. In general, proximal biceps tendon rupture is usually a non-surgical situation. Distal biceps tendon rupture. You must know the anatomy of the elbow region. It is really very important. You must know the biceps have two insertion sites. The bicipital abenerosis, which is attached to the fascia of the forearm, and the distal biceps tendon, and that is attached to the radial tuberosity. You must know that medial to the biceps tendon, you will find the brachial artery, then the most medial structure will be the median nerve. And lateral to the biceps tendon, you will find the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. You will find the superficial radial nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve. You'll also find the recurrent radial artery is volar to the biceps tendon. You approach the biceps tendon by going into the interval between the pronator teres and the brachioradialis muscles. Distal biceps tendon rupture. The tendon ruptures at the radial tuberosity. Patient will feel a pop at the elbow when the tendon ruptures. Distal biceps tendon tear most commonly occurs in the dominant arm of males in their forties, and the injury frequently occurs during eccentric contraction of the biceps muscle. This rupture of the distal biceps tendon must be repaired, otherwise there will be loss of flexion and spination. The patient will feel a pop with pain, swelling, and weakness of the elbow. The biceps muscle may retract into the upper arm, causing a bump or a bapai sign. Examination, you will see weakness, inflection, and supination. The biceps will migrate proximally and use the hook test. How do you do the hook test? The patient actively supinates and flexes the elbow to 90 degree, and the examiner will palpate the tendon from the lateral side. 
If the distal biceps tendon can be hugged from the lateral side of the elbow, then the biceps tendon is intact. A complete biceps tendon tear is detected by performing the hug test. If there is no tendon that can be hugged with the finger, then this is an abnormal hug test indicating the tendon ruptured distally. Here you can see the tendon is intact. And here the tendon is missing because it's ruptured and migrated proximally. How about the squeeze test? It is another test, not as popular, but it may be used to diagnose the distal biceps tendon rupture. The elbow will be flexed 60 to 80 degrees and the forearm will be resting comfortably. Start with the forearm in a slight pronation. Spination of the forearm will occur when squeezing the biceps if the biceps is intact. If the biceps is ruptured, there will be no forearm spination. If not repaired, rupture of the distal biceps tendon may lead to weakness of elbow flexion and forearm supination. If you don't repair it, the patient will lose 40% of supination and 30% of flexion of the elbow. The brachialis is also an elbow flexor, but the biceps is the dominant supinator of the forearm. It must be repaired. And the repair should be done early within a few weeks or the tendon will be retracted, scarred, and difficult to pull down. If longer than four weeks, the operation will be harder and a tendon graft may be needed. A single anterior incision, which can be transverse or extensile. Here there is transverse incision distal to the antecubital fossa for distal biceps tendon repair. When you make the incision, identify and protect the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. This little nerve is a hot topic in orthopedics. Supinate the forearm to protect the radial nerve. Then find the biceps, extract it, suture it so you can pull it down and get it ready for repair. And always protect the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Extensile approach is used for more chronic cases or when the tendon is very retracted proximally. Or you may want to use double incision, an anterior incision and posterior incision. So which one is better? Both anterior and double incisions have similar success rates. Both have similar percentage of complications, but the type of complication is different. The single anterior incision may injure the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve due to retraction that's required during exposure, especially if the patient is muscular. The double incision, the anterior and the posterior one, has a higher incidence of myositis ossificans and synestosis. So basically, you're going to go into the interval between the brachioradialis and pronator teres. You're going to avoid the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, and you're going to ligate the radial recurrent artery. The radial tuberosity can be identified by following the natural anatomic bath of the biceps tendon. This natural anatomic bath should be cleaned and the entire biceps tendon footprint should be seen before attachment of the tendon. You're going to find the radial tuberosity, anchor the tendon to the radial tuberosity, and you're going to give a splint for about four weeks. For anchoring the tendon to the tuberosity, you will use suture anchors 
or cortical button or cortical button and the interference screw. A combination of a cortical button and the interference screw is stronger than a single technique. You can also use an intraosseous screw fixation. After surgery, thumb up, that means the radial nerve is working. And if you have a lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve injury, the patient will complain of persistent radiating parathesia along the lateral side of the forearm. At that point, you rule out lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve injury. This nerve injury is usually temporary. It's a neuropraxia, and it resolves with observation and anti-inflammatory medication. It may take up to six months for improvement. Surgery for exploration or release is done in chronic cases. Complication. The concern for the repair is the risk of operative complications due to the proximity to the neurovascular structures. The lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve injury is the most common complication, and it is temporary. The posterior interosseous nerve injury and tendon re-rupture is the most common major complications. The complication rate following single incision is higher than that of the dual incision technique because of the high frequency of neuropraxia to the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. You may have vascular injury or synestosis and myositis ossificans. From what is the operative technique that increases the supination strength in repairing the tendon in an ulnar position on the radial tuberosity footprint with the forearm in supination? Slab lesion, usually seen in coronal MRI view. This is a lesion of the superior labrum. The superior labrum serves as the insertion of the long head of the biceps. This slab lesion, usually common in throwing athletes. And the clinical diagnosis can be made by performing the O'Brien test. We call it the active compression test. The O'Brien test is more sensitive, but not very specific. So if you have a slab lesion, then the O'Brien test probably will be positive. If you do the O'Brien test and you find it positive, it doesn't mean you have a slab tear. How do you do the O'Brien's test? The patient is standing or sitting upright with the arm at 90 degree of flexion and 10 degree of adduction and full internal rotation with the forearm pronated. The examiner applies pressure to the forearm and instructs the patient to resist the downward force being applied. So you can see here the internal rotation of the arm with the pronated forearm. Pain at the shoulder joint suggests a slab lesion. Decrease of pain in the shoulder joint on spination of the arm is suggestive of a slab lesion. The majority of the tests used to diagnose a slab tear is sensitive, but none is specific. So there is no single test that can precisely diagnose a slab tear. So the examination is non-specific. The patient will give a history of popping and clicking in the shoulder, especially during overhead activity. The MRI will show a bright signal within the superior labrum as seen in coronal MRI view. The superior labrum anchors the biceps tendon and this is considered a weak link that can develop a slab lesion. 
be aware of anatomy variants on the MRI, such as sublabral foramen or a cess with a thickened middle glenohumeral ligament or Buford complex, which is a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament. If you repair that complex, there will be severe loss of external rotation of the shoulder. The sensitivity of the MRI for slab tear is about 50% because of increased number of false negative slab tears on an MRI because the lesion is hidden and could be missed. And when there's a lot of false negative, the sensitivity of the test goes down. The specificity is 90% due to a small number of false positive because you really can't see the lesion well. If the lesion is hidden, it will decrease the sensitivity, but it will increase the specificity. What is a slab lesion? Slab means superior labrum tear from anterior to posterior. And a Snyder classification is 1 to 4, as you can see here. What is slab tear Snyder classification? Type 1, degeneration and fraying of the superior labrum. The most common type is type 2, and it is characterized by a detachment of the superior labrum as well as the long head of the biceps from the glenoid. Type 3, there is a bucket handle tear, but the biceps root attached. Type 4, the labrum is torn and propagated to the proximal biceps. So what is the treatment? If the patient has a degenerative tear, this is usually treated conservatively first. The treatment will include physiotherapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, and rest. And for this degenerative tear, you will do surgery if conservative treatment fails, especially in middle-aged patient. Surgery is usually arthroscopic debridement of the labrum. In addition, you may need to do biceps tenotomy or tenodesis, depending on the age of the patient. Surgical repair is indicated in a young patient less than 30 years old with a traumatic superior labral tear. Type 2 slab tear is usually treated by surgical repair in a young patient. During repair of these labral tears, be aware of the variants such as Buford complex, cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament, and sublabral foramen, thickened middle glenohumeral ligament. These are not tears. These are normal anatomy variant. And if you repair it, thinking it's a tear, the patient will have pain and loss of range of motion, especially external rotation of the shoulder. Biceps tendon subluxation or dislocation. We know that the transverse humeral ligament and the pulley system holds the biceps tendon within the bicipital groove and this system can be injured. And when these structures are injured, the biceps tendon subluxes or dislocates in and out of the bicipital groove, and it can give a snapping sound. And if the patient have a snapping sound, it could mean the biceps is subluxing. This incompetency of the pulley system and dislocation or subluxation of the biceps tendon may be associated with a partial or complete tear of the subscapularis tendon. With complete rupture of the subscapularis tendon, the biceps tendon may dislocate from the groove and get pulled or displaced medially. 
So if you find there is dislocation of the biceps medially, look for subscapularis tendon tear. 88% of patients with biceps tendon subluxation are found to have subscapularis tendon tear. Here is a normal MRI transverse section of the proximal humerus. You can see the biceps tendon appears oval within the groove with no fluid around it. Here in this diagram, you can see the torn transverse humeral ligament and the subluxed biceps tendon. This medial subluxation of the biceps tendon is usually associated with transverse humeral ligament disruption and subscapularis tendon tear. In this cross section, you can see the bicipital groove is empty and the biceps tendon is subluxed medially. The biceps tendon is outside the groove, as seen in this axial view of the MRI. So how about that subscapularis tear? The subscapularis is an internal rotator of the shoulder. There are several tests for the subscapularis. The liftoff test is used to diagnose the presence of subscapularis tendon tear. Failure to maintain the position of the hand away from the lower back, then a tear of the subscapularis tendon is suspected. The liftoff leg test. The examiner will hold the patient's hand away from the back of the lumbar region and let go. Patient will be unable to keep the hand away from the back if the tendon is torn. The belly press test. The patient presses the palm of the hand against the abdomen with the wrist in a neutral position. This is an example of an intact subscapularis tendon. A positive sign for the belly press test occurs if the patient is unable to press his belly without wrist volar flexion or without the elbow falling posteriorly. So how do you treat biceps tendon subluxation? Conservative treatment, rest, modify activity, ice, physiotherapy, steroid injection, inject around the tendon, but not through the tendon. In general, the treatment for biceps tendon subluxation is usually conservative, and you would do surgery in the form of tenodesis if the condition doesn't improve with conservative treatment. How about the treatment of the subscapularis tear? In a complete tear, you would do surgical repair. A repair may be either open or arthroscopic. Biceps tenodesis is usually done if the biceps is involved in the process. Otherwise, subluxation of the biceps will stress and fail the subscapularis tendon repair. In fact, biceps tenodesis during repair of the subscapularis is associated with improved outcome. Sometimes tear of the subscapularis is not well visualized. The medial subluxation of the long head of the biceps strongly suggests that there is a subscapularis tear. Subscapularis tears are not always obvious on the MRI, so you need to search for that tear in the MRI and also in surgery. Close an inspection of the leading edge and the upper border of the subscapularis tendon at the time of arthroscopy is important. Look for the comma sign. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.